We are on camera. Thank you. Today is June 13th, 2016. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer at the History Center. And I've got the honor today of being with Mr. Don Eads of Roswell, Georgia. And Mr. Eads has agreed to come in and talk to us about his life, particularly his time in the military, and also his life before and after the military. And this is in conjunction with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Um, and we're very honored also to have Mr. Eads' daughter, Delane Eads, with us, and Sue Verhoff, who is a senior archivist here at the Atlanta History Center. Mr. Eads, we really appreciate you coming in today. Um, would you give us your full name and the city and state in which you were born? Elmer Donald Eads, Jr. Okay. Atlanta, Georgia. What else do you need? Where do you live now? I live in Roswell now, okay. which and is, a, a, you, uh, the Library of Congress may not know it, but it's a suburb, okay. a, a bedroom community of, of the city of Atlanta okay. in, in Fulton County, in North Fulton County, but that's where I am. Okay. That's where we're located now. And what is the date of your birth? Well, today is June the 13th. I was born on June the 14th, 1928. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to me. Birthday, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, tomorrow's my birthday. Well, June the 14th, 1928, in answer to your question. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Uh, well, as I say, 19, I was born in 1928 at Emory Hospital, mm -hmm. and, and it's still in existence, the same, the original building which was the first part of the first of Emory Hospital, all that beautiful marble. It's now mostly administrative, but I think there are still some medical uh, things done there. I don't know, but of course Emory has expanded there everywhere now. But um, I think, and I'm not, I may be wrong, but I think it was in the city limits at that time it may, and still is. So yeah, it was Atl Atlanta, Georgia is my birthplace. What else? Well, did you have brothers and sisters? A little I bit about your parents if you want to yeah, talk about I them. have one brother living now. He's younger than I by about six and a half years. I had a sister who is now deceased, younger still. She's gone. Um, did I do it? Did I hurt? No, 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 you're okay. fine. <laughs> I reached up. No, never mind. Um, my parents were from this part of the country. My mother was from the low country, South Carolina. Um, Marion County, Horry County down in there, which is what, what, we, what is referred to as the low country. Tobacco and rice country. Uh, she grew up there in, in South Carolina, and after she graduated from high school, she went to a business college to learn what for the, in, in those days was uh, very advanced uh, business practices for stenography. She, was, she could take shorthand, she could type, she could operate a comptometer, whatever that is. Now I don't. It was a form of yeah. uh, of uh, device for processing language. I mean um, numbers and stuff. Yeah. But anyway, so she came to Atlanta, and uh, she had a, an aunt here, and she lived with her, and her aunt's husband was a barber. And he had a barber sh uh, shop in the, um, I think it was the Hurt Building, one of the downtown, uh, one of the old, old downtown yeah. buildings, still there, by the way. And uh, a lot of his customers were, you'll pardon the expression, lawyers. Double, I, double I, I, I know, I say that for <laughs> your benefit. I know that you are an ex-lawyer or retired <laughs> lawyer, right. Joe. But anyway, he had a lot of lawyers in the building that were customers of his, 
and he would tell them, I have this niece, and she's looking for a job. And one of them said, okay, I'll hire her. And so she went into a, a law office as, and became, what, a legal secretary, oh. I guess. Oh. His name was Stanky, I think, or some lawyer named Stanky. But anyway, that was her as, a, as an unmarried young woman. Oh. My father grew up in North Georgia. He was born in Jackson County, Hushton, and uh, some they they call that all different kinds of names: Hushton, Houston, Hush, you know. But it's called Hushton now. Still is. It's kind of like Cairo, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> they, they call it Cairo in Egypt, but it's Cairo. Yeah. But he was born in North Georgia on a sharecropper for, on a farm belonging to somebody in Houston. I don't know who it was, but his father, my grandfather, was a sharecropper. And uh, he had married my grandmother and uh, she was she she was a Simpson, and her father was a big land over. I'll say that in a minute. A big land owner in um, Hall County. So they moved over so that he could watch over them and help them, and he did. And my grandfather wound up working for him um, again as a tenant farmer, share, sharecropper, if you will. Uh, but he also ran the steam engine to uh, operate the, the mills, the sawmill and other items mm -hmm. that the old man had, old man Simpson. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, my grandfather met and married his daughter. and yeah. Their oldest child was Elmer D. Eads, my father, and he grew up on a uh, farm there in Hall County and couldn't wait to get out. <laughs> and when he was 18, he did get out. He left and he, was, he, he, he never graduated from high school, but he was in school and he got out and left and went to Chattanooga uh, where he had relatives and an aunt who was the sister of my grandmother and uh, lived with them and worked in a furniture store there for a while and a salesman that called on the store on the furniture store was from Atlanta told him about a job that was existent in Atlanta and he could handle it and so he went down came down here and became a shipping clerk for a company called Brunswick, Brunswick Bulk Colander Company. They're still in business in the bowling alley, alley, uh, bowling alley business. And they also used to do a lot, they made pool tables and that kind of stuff. Anyway, my mother had moved our own and from the lawyer business and uh, was a secretary in, in the office. And they met and were married in 1924. Okay. Uh, and their firstborn child is sitting here in this chair. That's me. So uh, basically that was the, the origin of the family. Where did you go to high school in Atlanta? I did not make it to Marist, but I made it to Boys High School in Atlanta, yeah. Georgia. I mentioned Marist because I know that you are yeah. A graduate of Marist, and so is As, my daughter yeah. and uh, my son. But anyway, um, I went to Bo I graduated from Boys High School, and incidentally, while at Boys High School, this the war, Second World War, uh, we were all we were all boys, as was Marist in those days, and we were in ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps. Uh, there were 800 of us, and our primary 
training was to march around with World War I rifles. 1906 Springfields, we had 800 of those. I, I remember having to clean them. Uh, so we took, uh, I guess, quasi-military training, uniforms and all of that. But in the afternoons, after school, we worked at various, if you will, defense jobs. Huh. And defense, uh, well, defense-related jobs. I was lucky enough to wind up uh, in a job at uh, the old Atlanta City Auditorium working for the Office of Price Administration, the OPA. We, that was the government agency in charge of rationing. And we issued food ration cards, uh, gasoline cards, gasoline rationing cards. My father had a 1941 Ford, which he bought just before the war started. And he got a, an A sticker, three gallons a week. That's, that was all, uh -huh. it was, you know, that's the way it was. And we were responsible for issuing those things and sending out, uh, it was strictly uh, clerical work that a yeah. high school kid could do. And that's what we did. When you were 11, 12 years old, I guess 12 or 13, when Pearl Harbor was attacked. Correct. Would you describe your feelings, your observations, you know, just what, how people reacted around you when Pearl Harbor was attacked? We had a radio in our home. And Sunday, we always listened to Jack Benny and, mm -hmm. uh, golly, I can't remember some of, that, some of the other programs, but they interrupted the Jack Benny program on Sunday afternoon to tell us that uh, the Japanese, who the heck ever they were, and I didn't know, yeah. I was, had just attacked Pearl Harbor and uh, it was a tragedy. I'm not, it, it didn't get as much coverage. It got, it, it, the country was informed, naturally. And it was in the next morning's Atlanta Constitution. There were two papers, not the AJC that we now know, but the morning paper was the Constitution and the evening paper was the Atlanta Journal. And we took them both, by the way. Um, and it was in, in, the, in the Constitution the next morning. Yeah, it was a big deal. Atlanta was excited, a lot of people were. It did not get as much coverage as the um, incident in Orlando yesterday, <laughs> which you can't turn on your yeah. television now without hearing all about it. And we don't know anything about it, but anyway. So we didn't know, well, that's all we knew. Hey, we've been attacked. Then there was a great outpouring of people who were eligible you going down and, uh, and enlisting and, and, and yeah, it was a great outpouring of patriotism, if you will. Yeah. It was suddenly stirred up. Nobody had been thinking about it. Sure, the, it wasn't, yeah, we're in the war. The war was not new. Uh, in England, they call it the 1939 war. And nobody refers to it as World War II. The World War was the Great War, 1918. Yeah. Yeah. That was the World War. Then we got into it again, and that was World War II. Yeah. <laughs> but it was not dubbed World right. War II. Nobody thought of that until probably after the war, I yeah. think. Yeah. Uh, but it was just a war, and we're in it now. Okay. And yeah, it was expected, I think, not, not the way it happened. But we, this country was involved uh, with Lend-Lease 
an aid to the, quote, allied countries that were fighting against primarily Adolf Hitler. Right. It was the European war. Well, I know you went in towards the end of the war. Talk Very about much what, what led up to your joining Okay. Military. As I say, I was at ROTC. I was working at the OPA. Graduated from high school. <clears throat> and then, well, that in those days you had to register for the draft uh, at 18. And... Um, the pe when I did, the guy, draft board said, well, we will get you. And I said, well, I, I didn't know they were still drafting. He says, yes, we are. We are still drafting, and, and there will be, and this was something that was being talked about by the War Department, UMT, Universal Military Training. And we're going to take all the young people and, and do this. And they attempted it for a short, short time. didn't work, and <laughs> so it died out. But they said, yeah, we will probably have you. I said, okay. Well, I, want to, I don't want to be drafted. I want to go and be, in, I want to join the Navy. I want to be in the Navy. So I went down to a, an enlistment office. And uh, they said, well, you can join the Navy for three years. if you." I said, I don't want to go in for three years. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Well, you can join the Army for three years or two years or even 18 months, I said, I'll take one of those. <laughs> I enlisted. And as I said, it was over. I mean, they'd yeah. blown up Nagasaki and Hiroshima and Tokyo, by the way. We killed as many people and destroyed as much property in Tokyo with conventional, if you will, if there is such a thing as a conventional bomb. But we had destroyed by then the um, Japanese Air Force. They, could, they didn't have any defense, so we, we bombed Tokyo at will. And, and of course, all the houses were made out of paper, so we're told. <laughs> but anyway, it, the place was destroyed. So yeah, there was Nagasaki, Hiroshima, and Tokyo were destroyed. People don't think about that. or It was so horrified. Yeah. Even Mr. Obama yeah. horrified at the thought of... Uh, us being the instigator of the nuclear age. Uh, he didn't, he did not use the word apology, but hmm, yeah. that's current politics. We, <laughs> I don't think you want to know that. Uh, but yeah, I, I went down and enlisted and was sent to the now defunct Fort McPherson, Georgia, for induction mm -hmm. and processing. S then sent to, um, sure, in North Carolina, where the Air F where the uh, 82nd is, Fort Fort Bragg. Bragg, North Carolina, was sent to Fort Bragg first, and then from there sent on to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And uh, that, that was an experience in itself, just being in New Jersey and <laughs> living among those people. You had there. never been up there before, I said. Yeah, I went to the 1939 World's Fair. Oh. M my parents, my yeah. father did, took us there. So yeah, we'd been, there, been to New York and back. That's yeah. it. But no, we'd, I hadn't been to New Jersey or, or anything else. But anyway, that was a real typical Army experience. Everybody that was in the Army went through that sort of basic training. That's, yeah. ba that's what they called it, basic training. Dad, tell them about the, the pizza in New Jersey. The what? Pizza. The guys took you for pizza. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we could, uh, <laughs> we would have the, uh, we would get passes uh, rarely. But uh, after Saturday morning inspection, you might get a pass for Saturday night. You better be back Sunday morning. But anyway, we couldn't go very far. Like you couldn't go to New York or Philadelphia, but you could get to Trenton, which was close by. And I was with a group of soldiers 
people that I was in, in, in Easy Company that I was training with, and we all went to Trenton. Just God, I don't know what the heck we were going to do, but we all went to Trenton, and it was it got to be late in the afternoons. We're getting hungry. Somebody said, "Okay, let's go get a pizza." What is a pizza? I didn't know. I had never. There were no. There was no pizza in Atlanta. And uh, so they they explained to me, yeah, yeah, you'll like it. We're going over here to this little place, and we'll order a pizza. And you'll. I said, well, what is it? I said, they said it's a tomato pie with cheese on it. Oh, I, thought, <laughs> you know, no, <laughs> apple pie. Yeah, I'm familiar. <laughs> Peach pie, potato pie, sweet potato pie. I never heard of a tomato pie. Hey, I liked it. <laughs> I still do. I still do. I do not like pepperoni on my pizza. Don't, didn't then and I don't now. She does. My daughter does. Uh, the, yeah, that was, that's something that amuses my family. Well, that is interesting. That, uh, because now we think pizza's everywhere. Well, yeah. It is. Yeah, but, sure. Uh, not there. Sure, Domino's comes to the house. Yeah. But uh, it didn't then. There was no pizza. We did have Chinese restaurants in Atlanta. Not many, but one or two. Uh, I remember one, I can't remember the name of it. There was a French restaurant downtown near the old post office. And that was supposed to be very, very good, but I never went there. But no, we didn't have any foreign food at all. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Fried the, chicken and cornbread. Absolutely. And the, and, uh, and the, uh, the cornbread was ubiquitous. Fried chicken was Sunday. That's right. Yeah. That is. Uh, that was, uh, this, yeah. sure, this was the deep south, yeah. let's face it. So you were up in New Jersey. Talk about where you went from there and just your experiences as you were in the military, from going from place to place and what you did. And well, you yeah, served. we finally did get to um, New York, some of us did. In fact, I think I remember going to New York over Christmas. I think it was, but anyway, we got to uh, Radio City Musical and got to see the Rockettes. And it was, you know, we were in uniform, so they, psh, come on in. Every, huh. They they still had that uh, yeah. uh, USO feeling in those yeah. days, and uh, yeah. I was impressed with Radio City Musical and the Rockettes. They were fantastic. They were fa I don't see how those women have lasted so long. They're beautiful. <laughs> and still. Still. And I I am sure it's the same ones. I don't That's, think they ever turn them over. They no, just keep them going. Oh, man. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was, yeah. Uh, I, I don't remember going to Philadelphia, uh, but... Oh, I do remember, had a guy in our company who was from Brooklyn. And occasionally he would, we could get a pass a weekend, maybe, or something of that sort. And he could go home. I couldn't. I couldn't go to Atlanta. But he would take us, he took me home with him. And uh, I spent, uh, I guess, Saturday night in Brooklyn. And he lived in a row house, three steps right off the sidewalk. Up. Oh. I was amazed. I did, I'd never seen anything like that. Uh, he was a nice guy. In fact, he went on and applied for USMAP, the United States Military Academy Prep School. So he went to the prep school, finished that, and went on to, I stayed in touch with him. He went on to West Point and became an Army officer. Okay. And I lost touch with him after that, of course, but yeah. Um, now that, you went to Alaska after that, is that correct? Yeah, as I said, they sent us finally across the country to Fort Lawton, Washington, which was outside of Seattle. It's no, it again is no longer in existence. It's kind of like Fort McPherson. It's not there. It is now a city park in Seattle. 
but it was a port of embarkation is what it was, POE. And uh, they would gather them from all over the country, wherever they were bringing people in for POE, and send them down to, in a contingent, in a shipping contingent, down to Pier 90, which is still there, and it's still an embarkation point. Mm -hmm. Pier 90, uh, which operated by the Navy, and uh, put, me, put, us, oh, put us on a ship, but not for Japan, for Alaska. So we went up, I, I got a cruise, I got an Alaskan cruise, up the inside passage, past Can uh, Vancouver, past Canada, oh. and all the way up to Port Whittier, which is on Seward, that area. And then we got off the ship and were put on a train, the Alaska Railroad. There were no roads in Alaska in those days. The Alcan Highway was the only thing. Uh, but there were no roads, but there was a railroad went from the coast all the way to, uh, sure, we're past Anchorage, of course, uh, Fairbanks, we went to Fairbanks. I didn't go to Fairbanks, got off at uh, Fort Richardson, Alaska, <clears throat> and stayed there for a year. How did you get from the East Coast to the West Coast? Oh, I mentioned the troop, troop train. Yeah. Talk mm -hmm. about that a little bit. Well, there were all kinds of troop trains. During the war, there were trains that had nothing but military material and troops on it. That's all that was being shipped. But there were also passenger trains, and they would attach, they being the War Department, they would attach cars to passenger trains and drop them off wherever they wanted to. So yeah, we were just attached to a passenger train. I don't know um, what, I, I, it was in New York Central, that's who it had to be, going across the country uh, to Chicago and then on to we were attached to a train in Chicago, Mil Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Mil Milwaukee, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific Railroad. That was the name of the thing. And the, and the train was called the Empire Builder. They were very proud of their trains in those days. And they were, they were fine trains, I'm yeah. sure. Not, not our part. <laughs> and uh, we had guards military police at, at the ends of our, of our cars, and we were not allowed off, and we were not allowed to mingle with the civilians. I mean, you, you just didn't do that. So it was kind of boring, really. You could look out the window and you saw uh, Northern Illinois, <laughs> and you, you know, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it was, and, and I don't know what, well, Montana, you know, yeah, yeah. there's some mountains. But uh, it was really a boring trip. Yeah. Not fun. Huh. The food was lousy. But that's typical of the Army. Yeah. Other than that, it was a great trip, right? <laughs> yeah, other than that, I had a wonderful time. <laughs> what was your assignment when you got where you were? In, stationed. In Alaska? Yeah. I was in the Signal Corps and, and we had at Fort Richardson a very modern 1,000 line dial telephone system just for use in the, huh. and, and I worked in the uh, office there uh, and, and in the, well back there where the test board was, all the little equipment. Uh -huh and uh, things that made it work, that's yeah. what I did. Now, uh, in the morning, we would get up, uh, six o'clock, totally dark in the wintertime, totally dark. 
go down to our mess hall, which was a company mess, by the way. That was that was wonderful. The only people that ate in that mess hall was our company. We had our own cooks. Uh-huh. I never will forget the first time I, I went to breakfast there, and a guy standing back said, "How would you like your eggs?" I said, "What? <laughs> yeah, never. <laughs> Wait a minute. Whose army is this anyway?" <laughs> Uh, how, how many eggs do you want, and how do you like them? And I, I'll have two and over light, and bacon or sausage. You know, ah oh, man, this is great. Now there are no biscuits. We do have uh, had toast, but no biscuits. No, they don't know how to make a biscuit. And and yeah, whatever you want, they make oh. it for you. So yeah, that was good. That part was yeah. great. Then after we, after chow, after breakfast. We would walk very quickly, because it was cold, out to a corridor that was in the hospital. And these are all temporary buildings, if you will, or wooden buildings. Nothing concrete, nothing brick or anything like that. And these long corridors that had various military, uh, 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 medical wings off each car if you, you, you and you could just stay in the car because it was warm mm-hmm. you were it was heated yeah. and warm and we go all the way through the hospital use it as a, 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 just a way to get to work yeah. and uh, still dark yeah. stay be there all day come back and it was dark. <laughs> you never saw, never the, saw the sun. Yeah, we never went outside, never went in, very little sun. Besides, it was the, they, the midnight sun, yeah. if you will, that kind of thing, which, uh, yeah, it was interesting. It, it was an interesting place to be. I had friends there that I met and made, made friends. Um, and we did have a lot of free time uh, and we spent it in the woods. If I mean, psh, that's what was around there. Now, uh, when I first got there, I tried to go into Anchorage itself and find out what they had, but it was so expensive I couldn't afford it. Yeah. No soldier could afford it. Yeah. Um, stay on the base and uh, stay on the fort, right. and and. Uh, you could ha- well, for example, all of our food came up in refrigerated ships from Seattle, and the one thing that they could not get right, never did get right, is milk. Huh. You put milk in a wood in a cardboard waxed cardboard carton and freeze it, and then you take it into the mess hall and thaw it. It ain't milk. No more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but it was <laughs> awful. And um, was it more like cream? N- yeah, and it was totally separated. Yeah. It was more like water. Yeah, yeah it was terrible. But anyway, I <laughs> said, "Okay, I'll go into Anchorage and I'll have some milk because they had fresh milk. I don't know how they got it, but they did in these restaurants. But uh, it was like two dollars for a glass of milk, you know, yeah. and." <laughs> you couldn't afford, a soldier can't afford yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I didn't go. So we stayed on the base. Uh, when it went into the woods, there were all kinds of animals, deer, moose, elk, bears, uh, and I never shot any of them. What would I do yeah, yeah. with a dead moose? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if I brought that back to the mess hall, say, here, I brought this, cook it for me. No, no, no. So I didn't. Yeah. Uh, some of the guys did. They, they would hunt. Oh, and the rabbits. They would shoot oh, the rabbits, yeah. the snowshoe rabbits. Yeah. And ptarmigan, which is a little bird, yeah. runs around in the, uh, in the tundra there. But um, I, didn't, I wasn't interested in that. What unit were you in while you were there? Okay. It was a service company, the 171st, 171, 171st Signal Service Company. And that that was the unit now. I don't know. 
I never did know who they were attached to, like uh-huh. a regiment or a, okay. a battalion, or any, or I, I don't know who they were. They didn't tell us. No, I didn't care. Right. When you left um, Fort Richardson, did you go to another base then, or what happened? Then? No, uh, I had enlisted yeah. for 18 months, and at the end of that period, they sent me right straight back to Seattle, to Fort Lawton, Washington, out and back, went right straight back to Fort Lawton. And that was, there was an interesting experience there, as it turned out. Had people coming in from everywhere, all over the Pacific that were coming in for discharged, for being processed to be discharged. And uh, so the, we were, uh, we came in, I think we, we docked on a Sunday morning and nothing happens in the Army on Sunday, forget it. So put us on uh, trucks and took us out to back out to Fort Lawton. And on Monday morning, uh, I remember him, <laughs> I remember the guy, he was a major and he stood up in front of a whole auditorium full of people and said, welcome home, you've done a fine job. Page two, wait, you know, one of those things. Now this is what you can expect while you're here. You'll be given a physical and various things for being processed for discharge into civilian life. One of the opportunities which will be afforded to you is the opportunity to enlist in the reserves, in the U.S. Army Reserve. And of course he got a big, yeah, you know, no, no, he says, take it easy. We have noticed over the weeks and months that we have been doing this, that those who enlist in the reserves seem to get out of here with a discharge faster than those that don't. <laughs> Carrot, stick, yep. you know. Yep. <laughs> I said, where do I sign up? <laughs> hey, you're, doing, uh, you're coercing me and I'm being coerced, let's go. <laughs> so yeah, I signed up right then in Seattle in Fort Lott, at Fort Lawton for the uh, reserves. And they said, okay. You will be sent home, and uh, you will be contacted, and we suggest that you go to the VA and contact them, but you will be contacted by your reserve officers. They'll tell you where to go to begin your reserve training. And uh, I came home, first thing I did was start back to college. Now was this around 1948? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah it was. And I, I, I started in the spring quarter at the Atlanta Division of the University of Georgia, which no, which is now a Georgia yes. State. It's, it is morphed into uh-huh. Georgia State, which is <laughs> bigger than the University of Georgia now, yeah. in terms of uh, students. Ah, uh, but anyway, sure. Then I did hear from. Someone in the Georgia uh, Reserve uh, and said, "Okay, we will assign you. We have assigned you to a signal unit since you were Signal Corps, and we meet at and I I don't remember the say Monday night at six at seven o'clock." at the, uh, <coughs> it's now the Potts City Market. Is it the old Sears building? Yeah, well, uh, no, it was the one it? next door to it, uh, which was the old Ford plant. Ford plant. It had been a, in the 1920s, I guess, a Ford Motor Company plant. They built it, and the thing is enormous. Mm-hmm. In fact, they can drive, they do, or did, drive railroad cars right into the, plant to unload. It's built like a fortress, still there. 
anyway, that's where you're to go. And uh, we'll start your reserve training. Oh, okay. I went one Monday or whatever the day was. And it was typical U.S. Army. <laughs> Sit. Some guy stood up. Okay, lecture, 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 lecture. At the f end of the first hour. Okay, time for a smoke. Take 10, smoke them if you got them. Smoke outside, T do it outside. Okay. I did, I had cigarettes and I went out to get a smoke and I never went back. <laughs> I, uh, I said, this is, you'll pardon the expression, baloney. <laughs> it was a different, this was bull. But anyway, I didn't go back. Okay. We'll reassign you to inactive status. You're still in the reserve, and you're still subject to recall if necessary. But don't worry about it. It's never been done except twice. They, they did. They call the reserves in the Second World War and whatever the other time was. But it's not a big deal. You're now in the inactive reserve for three more years. Okay, I don't care. I'm a student, man. I'm going to school, and by the way, I went, it, we were on the quarter system back then, and uh, you could go four quarters a year, summer quarter, fall, winter, spring, and summer, and that way you could make up for lost time. So I was catching up to you know, college education, and uh, never thought anything else about it until June of 19. 1950. I think it was the 20th, as I recall, that June of it's the 20th of 1950. The communist regime of North Korea attacked the Democratic Republic yeah, of, Repu of Korea, which was South Korea and moved across the DMZ, and we'll get into the DMZ in a minute, and uh, were moving against South Korea, and they had no defense. And the United Nations says, whoa, big, big organization. It's headquartered in New York. It was founded in San Francisco. Wonderful organization, the United Nations. They do a lot of good all over the world, <laughs> stopping stopping wars and that sort of thing. The best part of the United Nations is UNICEF, the United Nations Children's uh, Emergency Fund, yeah, whatever. But anyway, the United Nations says, stop, you can't do that, stop, stop the war, or stop this uh, attack. Didn't happen. Okay, we gotta have help. Mr. Truman, please send help. And he said, why? I don't have an army anymore, we have demobilized everything. What? But I tell you what I'll do. I will call the reserves and send them. You, we'll send you our reserves, and I will even go one step further. I will call out the National Guard, which is all over the country. I'll call in the National Guard and the reserves, and we'll send them. I got my orders in July. I still have them in a safe deposit box <laughs> at the Wells Fargo on Holcomb Bridge Road. Wow. They're there. And you're ordered to report for active duty uh, to uh, to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, for in processing and shipment to Camp Stoneman, California, for transshipment to FECOM, F-E-C-O-M, which was. Uh, acronym for the Far East Command. You're on your way. Now, we, they had, in all their wisdom, they had changed my branch of service, and I was now in ordnance. I was being assigned to an ordnance ammunition company, which was going to FECOM. Uh, I don't know who they are, what they do. I do know what they do. They transport ammunition from the dumps, from the ammo dumps to the front lines. That's the basic job. Okay, what else for a private? You, that'll be good. 
That's what we'll do for you. You're going to do that. Ah, okay. I'm gone. I got to Jackson, Fort Jackson, uh, and it had been closed, by the way. Mr. Truman closed down Fort Jackson because when he integrated the armed forces, the people of South Carolina, who are hotheads anyway, who we know that, yeah. re revolted. They said, we don't want integrated troops at our uh, yeah. fort here outside of Columbia. And he says, okay, I'll close it. I'll teach you, because yeah. that's an economic blow yeah. to the city and the state. Yeah. And he did. Yeah. So it had been closed down. And when we were called back there, we were called back to nothing. They had, they were not prepared. There was no one to prepare. But anyway, at that point, I ran into an old master sergeant guy named Taylor, Maynard Taylor, and he was he, he was a, a lifer. He'd been in before the war, and he was still in, and he was going to stay there for thirty years, and he did. He'd been sent there to help open up this place. And they brought in uh, the 8th Infantry Division. Well, the, there wasn't really a division. It was just on paper. And he was a part of the, of the headquarters of the 8th Infantry Division, and he needed help. And he says, okay, you've got some college? Yeah. And your prior service? Yeah, you know how, to, how the Army works? Yeah. I will have your orders broken at uh, in Washington. I'll have your orders broken and have you assigned here. <laughs> Lucky. I mean, you talk about a lifesaver. Yeah. I never left Fort Jackson. Wow. Yeah. H headquarters and Headquarters Company, 8th Infantry Division. And I stayed in as long as my enlistment, until my enlistment yeah. expired. And I have a, I have also in that safe deposit box at Wells Fargo on Holcomb Bridge Road an honorable discharge from the United States oh. Army. They can't touch me anymore. <laughs> Congratulations. <Yeah. laughs> and I'll never I have never even volunteered for the Boy Scouts since the, <laughs> You learned your lesson. I did. <laughs> I'm I'm joking. I did a lot for the Boy Scouts. But anyway, that was it. So you, uh, I've got the date here on your paperwork. You got out in 1951, right? Got out of the Army? Is that yes. Okay. Yes, okay. I did. That was 51. That's correct. Well, talk about what you did after that. Uh, just give us a little information. Oh, after, on. well, like, I still had a year to go. I was a senior. And instead of coming back to Atlanta, I went straight to Athens. And, uh, that was a smart move. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> it was. Uh, I, I did my final senior year in Athens, enjoyed it thoroughly. I even actually joined a, a fraternity over there, oh. Pi KA. Yeah. Um, oh, by the way, by that time I was married. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, graduated, got out of school, 52, and went on to a career, if you want to call it that. Uh, I went to work for RCA, which also no longer exists. The name does. They sold it to a French company. Uh, worked for them. and their home instrument department, which was what they called radio, stereo, television. So you were around when all the new technology was coming out? Yes. TVs? Yes. And the, the things I sold were all tube types. Everything was made with electron tubes, vacuum uh -huh. tubes. Uh, but transistors were just over the yeah. horizon. They were coming followed by the Japanese. Uh, <laughs> hey, they're clever. The, uh, you know, they, they're smart, those people. 
listen, if we need if we need something to build our country up, let's declare war on the United States. They'll beat us, and then they'll take care of us for the rest of our life. <laughs> well, you're Hirohito, huh? You're smart. basically correct. Mm, he was. <laughs> and the uh, folks in uh, Korea said, hey, you know, it worked for them. It's working for us, too. LG, um, Hyundai, uh, you name it. <laughs> Where is their market? To whom do they sell that stuff? Right. Right. Go look in your parking lot. <laughs> More power to them. Yeah. Well, did you stay in Atlanta throughout no. your career? Or? No. Uh, back to New Jersey oh. at uh, Camden, New Jersey, which was the headquarters uh, for RCA, except for the big building in New York. And let's see, we were in Camden, we were in New Jersey. Then sent to Dallas, Texas, and I covered the southwestern United States in the advertising okay. department. Uh, Oklahoma City, we lived in Oklahoma City. I have a son, let's see, in Dallas, I have a daughter who was born in Dallas, her older sister. In fact, I, I've always told people that the finest thing that ever came out of the state of Texas was my daughter an interstate 70, <laughs> uh, interstate, what is it, 20 east, east, interstate 20 east. <laughs> Finest thing that ever came out of Texas. But anyway, uh, yeah, it's 20, yeah, interstate 20. Um, Oklahoma City had a son born there. He Today he's in Mongolia. Mongolia? Mongolia? <laughs> That's a story in itself. What does he do there briefly? Drives a car. Okay. He's a race car driver. Okay. I, uh, it's an organization in Europe, in, in England, called ERA, the Endurance Rally oh. Association. Big over there. They have these big endurance rallies. Uh, last year he was in... Uh, the Sahara, the Sahara uh, rally, which was from Madrid to Marrakesh. And he was driving a 1938 Chevrolet coupe. Oh, they have to be old cars. These are endurance cars. But anyway, he's driving that car today in Mongolia. He, he left uh, Peking a couple days ago, and he's oh. doing the uh, Peking to Paris. It's now called Beijing, but it's yeah. the Peking to Paris run. Uh, wow. He'll he'll be racing for 36 days, mm. Peking to Paris, halfway around the world. He'll do, and oh, let's see, 8,510 miles yeah. total. But anyway, that's what he does. So how he, many children do you have? Uh, well, counting those two, I have three. Okay. That's that's number th <laughs> that one. Now she wasn't born in some foreign country like Dallas or <laughs> Oklahoma City or Indianapolis. Fortunately, we lived in Indianapolis. And, but I left them and came back to Georgia. Uh, that is RCA. I, I left RCA, came back to Georgia, and had a job in. Augusta, traveling eastern Georgia and, and about five counties over there in South Carolina. And she was born, my daughter, my youngest daughter, in uh, Augusta in uh, 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 1961. 1961, so she was born in Augusta, 19, that, that was it. I had three, I had two girls, and a, two daughters and a son, that's enough. Okay. Then we tra I was transferred, came back to Atlanta, which had been my goal all along. Yeah. We got back to Atlanta in 1963. Bought a house in um, what is now, I think it's in Brookhaven now, though, since they've changed. Yeah. All these new little cities that come around. 
and uh, bought a house that had been built once it was about five years old when I bought it in a little subdivision called Spring Mill. 140 houses in that small subdivision had a swimming pool and a community center and all that lovely place, wonderful place to raise kids. All they did all summer long, put on their bathing suit and go to the pool. We'd never see them until supper time. And they were safe. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse the emphasis, but yes. uh, you, uh, uh, today you wouldn't do that. But anyway, so we stayed there. Oh, by the way, it's right up the hill from Marist. Yeah. And uh, Marist was still an all-boys, military-oriented college. They had changed from uh, uh, Army ROTC to Air Force. And, uh, but they could see the handwriting on the walls, the folks at Marist, Father Hartnett, mm -hmm. Father Brennan, oh, yeah, he, Oh yeah, he built that school, Father Brennan, Vincent Brennan. He moved from, yeah. um, he was in charge when they moved from Ivy Street and he bought the land out there in DeKalb County. People, oh, what the heck, that's out in the wilderness. Why are you gonna put us, <laughs> ah, he did, it worked. But anyway, they saw the handwriting on the wall. They made, and, and people didn't like military schools at such. Yeah. So they made it optional and the Air Force says no. It, you, you, it's kind of like pregnancy, you either are or you're not. Yeah. But um, you will no longer be an Air Force. Or, and it's okay. So then they made a tremendous <laughs> decision to take girls. Well again, the pressure was on, everybody had Man, what are you talking about? All boys, you know, you gotta take girls. He, okay, we're thinking about it, we're gonna do it. By then, Father Hart was in charge. Brennan had gone to, I think, New Orleans. But Hartnett was in charge, and I went to him and I said, hey, I want an application. Now, if we're going to do it, I want to get in on the ground floor. And he says, okay. So they did. And the first girl that was admitted to Marist College, as it was known in those days, is sitting in the corner. My application was at first. Wow. Did you know that? I did not know that. It's a fact. I thought I knew a lot about Marist, but I didn't know that. Yep, it's a fact. She doesn't brag about it. No, she I do. She ought to wear something on her yeah, lapel. She that she she oh, her name is all over the up top there. Yeah, should be a building named after. <laughs> yeah, she might get that later. But there were actually there. There was another one. Um, Fish Lori L O R I Fish was admitted at approximately the same time right after, and Chuck and I. You know Chuck Fish, don't you? Okay, we've laughed about it. I said, mine was first. <laughs> well, poor old Chuck, he's all alone now. Yeah. Julie died a couple of years ago. Ah, well. And Lori is dead, too. The other girl that came in, as, as she did. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's how I wound up here. And so my son graduated from there. She graduated from my my older daughter would have, except she was older. So she graduated yeah. from Peachtree High School, oh, and went wow. on, and went on to the University of Georgia. Another good move. Yeah. Oh, well, listen, I, at great expense to the management, I might add. <laughs> she loved it over there so much that she decided to stay on. And get a master's degree. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> she has a master's degree in education. My son loved it so much, he stayed there for seven years and graduated with over 500 undergraduate hours. You should be proud of that. That's, that's an accomplishment. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At great expense to the management. <laughs> uh, and he graduated in, with a Bachelor of Science in Geomorphology. 
what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Oh, uh, well, okay. But it's, it's land masses, land forms, that kind of thing. Yeah. The study of, and his idea was to go to work for NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Mm-hmm. By then he was married and his wife says, oh no, you're not going to be out in some research vessel for se- uh, six mm-hmm. months out of the year. No, forget it. So instead he uh, got into the uh, pharmaceutical industry and stayed in the pharmaceuticals until he retired. And you retired from Marcia? That's, no, did you retire from No, Marcia? no. When I finally got back to Atlanta, I went in business for myself. Oh, okay. I was a manufacturer's rep. Okay. And uh, incidentally, I had a friend and partner, uh, a fellow named David Cullman. Did you ever know David Cullman? He, oh, okay. he graduated from Marist. And she might remember him. He was a docent he, right here oh. until he died. Cullman, David Cullman. Oh. Did Marge, Marge ever, I don't know whether she worked here or not, but David did. He loved it here. And uh, he's well, gone. He, he's dead now. You've had quite a life. So far, I mean, you really I'm looking forward still, to the. And you're still I'm looking more. forward to the rest of it. Yeah, wow. people ask me, say, well, "Well, what what is your goal?" And I said, "To be 89." <laughs> That's a good goal. <laughs> I mean, what else? <laughs> I want to go back and ask you about. I didn't want to interrupt you, but about something when you were up in Alaska. Yeah. You, you said you would walk through the hospital all the way. Yeah, just to get to stay warm. Yeah. Were were the patients primarily? Men and or women who had been injured in World War II? No. They were locally, I mean, they were people who had been injured locally. They were soldiers, of course, in right. the military hospital. Okay. Uh, but we we also had uh, Elmendorf Air Force Base was close by. By then, it was Air Force. It was no longer the Army Air Corps. They had their own, you know, with the bus driver's uniforms and that sort of thing. Uh, but we had a Air Force base there, and it's still there. Um, we had B-29 stationed there, and we had P-51s stationed there, and they they kept they had all kinds of accidents constantly. And uh, then just the the fact that you were in a hostile environment, people yeah. got hurt a lot. Yeah. We we got a lot of people hurt climbing telephone poles and. And having telephone poles fall on them. Yeah. I mean, sometimes the ground would freeze and squeeze a pole right out of the ground. Huh. Uh, oh, and the driving was an interesting. You know, you'd be driving a Jeep or a truck or something like that, and you're driving on ice because it would snow. Then you'd drive and you'd pack it down, yeah. and it would free and it would stay frozen. Yeah. So you're literally driving on ice, and just chains don't do any good. Ch- uh, chains are no good on ice. They're only good in snow. Yeah, we had a lot of people hurt constantly. Hmm. Oh. Well, I want to give Delane and Sue a chance for chances to ask any questions you want to ask or if there's anything that you've heard that your dad didn't talk about. Uh, if you want to bring that up or ask him to jog, if you want to jog his memory or just anything you have to say. Dad, where was the, um, the tents? Where were the tents that you had to live in? Fort was that in South Carolina? Uh-huh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Well, as I said, the place was closed up. So, yeah, that's... So those were your barracks, the tents? Sure, we put up tents. Um, the first night we got there from the Georgia contingent, with, there were 1,500 of us, showed up under orders, and they said, huh, what do we do? We do there was no one to feed them. Gosh. So we went to a hamburger joint, to, and I, that night I slept on the ground, but it was warm. It was okay. We, we slept on the ground that night. There was no other place. It, it, Miss, Mr. Truman had closed it up out of, huh. he was peaked. He was angry. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, no, it, it was a good thing to do. They were going to close it down anyway. They haven't yet. It's still operating. But But they weren't prepared for you no, at all. No, absolutely not. 
Wow. No. Yeah, we stayed in tents for a long time, but we got it. We got done what we had, to, and of course at that time we're dragging in, pulling in people from everywhere, reserves and the National Guard. They brought in. Well, we were there, as I said, the Eighth Infantry, and uh, they brought in the 31st Infantry Division, which was a National Guard division with out of Mississippi, Alabama, Western Tennessee, Northern Florida, maybe a couple of places along the western border of Georgia. But these little, every little town would have, still do, a National Guard armory. You've been, you've seen them. And maybe the uh, company commander would be the mayor of the town. First sergeant would be, uh, his police chief. So there was all a family thing. And, and incidentally, 31st Infantry was known as, and they had a double D on their patch, the Dixie Division. The 31st Infantry was the Dixie Division. And it was not integrated. They didn't do that in a small town in yeah. Mississippi or Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. Western Tennessee, that just wasn't done. And then they were nationalized and brought in to Fort Jackson. And uh, their commanding officer used to threaten the officers. Now you either shape up and straighten up and get that thing going right, or we'll ship you over to the Black and White Division which oh. was the 8th Infantry. We were integrated. Oh. And his threat to the Dixie Division was, we'll ship you into yeah. the black and white. Wow. <laughs> oh, I, I thought it was funny. <laughs> I enjoyed it. It was, it was a, 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 a source of humor. <laughs> Did they ever ship anybody over? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm sure they must have. I'm sure he must have. Didn't bother me. I didn't care. I wasn't an officer anyway. <laughs> you, you know, you're pretty much immune to a lot of that kind of yeah. stuff. Now, um, I have great respect for military officers. My daughter married one, my oldest daughter. Huh. Yeah, <coughs> she married a career army officer. He graduated. He was dis he. Retired, I'll get the word right in a minute, after 22 years as a lieutenant colonel. Oh. And uh, they have a wonderful family, too, who are all married graduates, yeah. all of his kids. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what it is about Maris. There's something, I do know what yep. it is. I do know what it is. Well, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they are great. They're great kids. In fact, I remember when they were in Germany the last time, uh, my oldest grandson had been to Marist before they sent them to Germany, and they were coming back. And I, we went to Father Hart and said, okay, he's coming back. Can we get him back in? Well, yeah, sure. You know, he's one of us. We'll be glad to have him back in the spring of the year. Uh, but I hope it's not going to be <coughs> was it eighth grade, I think? Ninth grade, yeah, I guess it was. I hope it won't be the ninth grade, because we are up to here with ninth graders, you know. Maybe seven, maybe eight. Uh, yeah, that'd be good. It's a ninth grader. Oh, okay, send him on. <laughs> so he came ahead of the family. He came here, lived with us, oh, and uh, went and got back into Mar state in Maris yeah. till he graduated, of course. And so did the rest of the family as they came yes. home. Incidentally, when they did come home and he got his discharge, we attended the retirement ceremony at Fort Mac. It was still in existence yeah. then. And uh, they didn't know where they were going to go or what they were going to do, but they knew that they were, what it was that was going to be here. So they said, well, can we stay with you? Can we live with you? until we could get settled in and get a house and that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, sure, you know, my daughter, my grandchildren, absolutely. 
18 months later. <laughs> that was an experience. <laughs> a long-term stay. A long-term stay. They stayed with us for 18 months, so we had... Delane, of course, was still in school. And yeah, it was fun. We had a, we had a good time. Is there anything else you want to say, either as a message to anybody that sees this or something that you left out that you want to talk about or anything you want to say before we stop? No, I don't think so. Uh, hey, it's been fun. It's been, uh, I've, I've been blessed all my life, I think. Uh, I had very good p parents. Uh, I was raised right, I guess. If you, I have been fortunate in the people that I worked with, and um, have been able to uh, make it on my own, if you will, as a rep, as a manufacturer's rep. Uh, I made good money, and uh, I, I raised a good, a great family. I'm very, very proud of them. I have, uh, as I say, three kids. I have six uh, grandchildren, and six great grandchildren all right here where I can put my hands on them, except two. My son, who lived in Chicago, in, in Elmhurst, Illinois, and worked in the pharmaceutical industry, has two of my grandchildren, one of whom now lives in western Michigan and has a son, so I can't reach them very easily. His son lives in northern Illinois, and I can't reach him either, but except for those two, we're still very, very close here together. And uh, I'm very proud of him, the, the race car driver. Uh, don't get to see him very much, but they do come here usually. Oh yeah, they, they spend a week around here at Thanksgiving because they are, they are all very close. Yeah via the internet with each other. Delane is in constant contact with them. I, I, I'm not. Uh, I am computer illiterate. I don't have one. I don't want one. I have a cell phone. That's, just, that's it. <laughs> but if I need anything from the internet, I have an assistant who does. And she, <laughs> so <laughs> she's right here. She's here. I don't need it. I'm too old yeah. to learn. I don't care. Well, I want to thank you again um, for sitting down and sharing your story. I mean, you say you were fortunate, but you obviously were a hard worker, and your parents and grandparents were hard workers. I mean, yeah, you yeah. talked about they were. being sharecroppers at one point. And yes. for you to be as successful as you've been is a credit to them, but a credit to you for yes. how hard you've worked. and you. Served twice in the military, yeah. which is more well, than some yeah, people it, have served. It wasn't my idea, but it was. But, <laughs> but you did it. But it, well, yeah, yeah, it you happened. You did it. Yeah. And, uh, and what you did was important. Yeah. And you've raised a great family and lived or continued to live a great life. We enjoy it, yes, and very much so. I just want to thank you again for doing this and thank you for your service. You're certainly welcome. And as I said, th there's nothing heroic there. I'm no Audie Murphy. Or anything. Who, you remember him? Did you, uh, you know I do who Artie Murphy? Yeah. A lot of people don't. Yeah. But uh, some things you have to do, right. and uh, it must be done. Well, I can't think of a better way to end this than that being said, because that's, that's so true. It. Fine. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, that was a.